Wow, it really is an honor to be here. I, I, you know, sometimes I think, how in the world did I end up in these spaces, hanging out with the heretics? Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> this is going to be a fun weekend. Um, and, uh, and folks up here dancing and stuff. I said, Sister Rachel, do the Anglicans do that? I don't know, man. So it was, it really is a pleasure to be here. I came from a, a, a luncheon of pastors in the Twin Cities, African-American pastors mostly, and, um, uh, and they always have a speaker at this luncheon. It happens every month. And the preacher today, <laughs> he got up and he said, um, he said, I'm going to tell you like, like Elizabeth Taylor told her husbands, I won't be with you long. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> that was, I guess you had to be old enough to get that one. Um, <laughs> but I am grateful, grateful for the opportunity to share with you and to be part of this, part of this weekend. Um, we're going to read a passage of scripture that's um, it's kind of a tough passage in some ways. It's from 1 Peter, and uh, I'll pray, and then I'll share a little bit with you. From 1 Peter chapter 2, yeah, starting at 18. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Lord, we give you thanks for who you are and for the reading of your word, even tough passages, which we'll be doing all this uh, weekend. We pray by your spirit that you would um, anoint this time, that you would bless it. You be pleased with the words of my mouth, that they be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock, our strength, our redeemer. We pray, Lord, right now uh, on, on behalf of sisters and brothers around the world who are hurting. We think about Mexico right now and um, the aftermath of an earthquake. We think of folks who have been hit by a hurricane. There's so much that's going on in this world, and we, your people, have the opportunity to show your love. And I pray, Lord God, that you would uh, help us to not just be a hearers of the word, but be doers. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So generally speaking, marginalized believers are the best teachers of what it means to be a follower of Christ. I'm going to say that again. Generally speaking, marginalized Christians, believers, are the best teachers of what it means to be a follower of Christ. We don't believe it, but I'm going to say it, and I'm going to try to illustrate it. And Christian America, as divided as it is, as arrogant as it is, as theologically selective as it is, and as beloved by God as it surprisingly is, needs to learn from marginal voices. What happened a little while ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, and what's happening around our country, it's demonstrated something that's always been part of the fabric of the United States of America. The white nationalism on display is part of what defined America. The KKK and other white supremacist groups are not an aberration. They're an extreme form of what lots of people in the country already believed. I'm going to have to give a shout out to my brother Greg because he's been bold enough to talk about this in, uh, from this uh, platform here, and I appreciate it. And I've been grateful for our, our friendship, Brother Greg, over these years. To make it worse, though, Christianity has been intertwined with nationalism. So consequently, white Christians have long enjoyed a certain social hegemony, right? The notion of Christian hegemony yeah, seems to be a big factor, at least it seemed to be so in the last presidential election. So my main point right now is to try to suggest the way forward based on what I just said earlier. I believe the way forward for the people of God in our context is to learn from those who have been oppressed. Not just listen to the voice of the oppressed, but learn from that voice. The people who first received this New Testament letter called 1 Peter were marginalized believers. They were diaspora people. Marginalized believers, even today, are like Peter's diaspora people. 
the ones that Peter calls chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, people that he borrows this Old Testament language for, they have been harassed and slandered and persecuted by the broader society. Yet Peter says these marginalized people are the people of God who have received mercy from God. They were once not a people, but now they are a people. They were once nobodies, but now they are somebodies. This is the way God operates. Even though they have been oppressed, these people will bring God glory. That's the way it works with the Lord. He takes what's foolish in the eyes of the world to show his wisdom. He takes the weak to show his power. So I'm saying that we don't always see the way of Jesus in people who have a dominant role in society. But for some crazy reason, we keep turning in that direction. We have to turn our heads and look in a different direction. We have to see the way of Jesus in those people on the margins, minorities, women, even children. Look in that direction to discern the way of Jesus. And as I say that, it might sound simple and straightforward, but it really is hard for us. We might have to retrain ourselves if we're willing to be retrained. I think God will breathe a fresh wind of the Spirit into us who are longing to see him move mightily in our world today. So I'm going to get to that controversial passage that I just read in a, in a minute. But first, let me point out that Peter calls his readers people of the diaspora. He calls them aliens. He calls them foreigners. And diaspora people don't confuse faith with nationalism. Foreigners and aliens, by definition, live outside of the mainstream. And Peter's readers, like, like immigrants throughout time, were socially disconnected from the dominant culture. These Christian believers were alienated in a hostile society. Diaspora is not a strange notion to African Americans. Now, several years ago, I used to subscribe to Christianity Today. I've always had this kind of love-hate thing with evangelicalism, but I'll, I, won't, uh, I won't belabor that. But I used to get a magazine. Remember what those were? <laughs> Magazines. And I used to get this magazine, Christianity Today, and you know, as I thumbed through, there would be these advertisements. They always kind of just irked me a little bit because the advertisement was for how you could find your family crest. And I always thought, well, they know their market. All these people from Europe, evangelicals reading this, you know, they, and I'm saying family crest. I just like, oh, brother. <laughs> I have this name Edwards. I have absolutely no idea how I got this name. I don't even know what country my people are from. Now, yeah, I did Ancestry.com, partly for fun, partly to see what, you know, leave something for the kids to think about. So, yeah, there's somewhere in West Africa, a large percentage of my DNA. The other, there was like 13% that's, yes, Scandinavian. <laughs> I know. And I'm not going to go down that road right now, but my goodness. I mean, what's funny is that I'm at a covenant church, which used to be Swedish covenant. And years ago, I was in the evangelical free church, Norwegians. And I'm not even a Calvinist. I wasn't predestined to be in those spaces, I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> but my point is, we were diaspora people. We, I don't even know where I'm from. So we have to name the whole continent. I'm African-American. We are people dispersed from a homeland, and our history in the United States is not, all, is not at all glamorous. So immigrants, even in our time, as well as those who are the offspring of slaves, know, we know the alienation that comes from a lack of familiarity with the, with, with, with the new setting and the xenophobia that comes from the host culture. And I'm continually amazed at the endurance of my forebearers, many of whom became Christians despite the evils of slavery, as well as American Christianity's ambiguous attitude towards slavery. Additionally, I'm motivated and I'm encouraged when I recall that our Lord Jesus was a voice from the margins. He shows that that can be a place of honor. So because Jesus himself experienced life on the margins, it's fair to say that African Americans may be in a unique position to model the way of Jesus. Now, the theological perspective formed by the oppressed is always, uh, always typically seen as aberrant. You know, we're the elective courses, not the required course. I'm not kidding. You know, if you take the required course, it's, you know, it's white European stuff. 
Peter's showing us that diaspora people, foreigners and aliens are in the best position to demonstrate the way of Jesus. Now, diaspora people often face alienation and other forms of suffering, but they teach us, they teach us faithful perseverance. So the passage before us today is one that, of course, is, is very difficult for me. And yeah, I did write a commentary on 1 Peter, and, and, um, and I was you know, stressed over that section quite a bit. It's addressed to slaves, and, and how can we read it without thinking about our own history here? Slaves who were brought from Africa to what would become the United States of America were thrust into an environment heavily influenced by Christianity. I spoke with a friend in academia who pointed out that the abolitionists largely arose from among the simple, pious, holiness Christians, not from those well-educated Princeton types. Oh, sorry, Greg. So, <laughs> I'm kidding, kinda. Those well, those well-educated predestinarian, powerful, wealthy believers, the ones whose ministry is held in highest regard by contemporary evangelicals, were the very ones using the Bible to justify slavery and who owned other human beings themselves. Many slaves in America, just like these slaves that Peter addresses, are among our best teachers when it comes to faithful perseverance. I mean, these are the people who gave us songs, songs in the midst of their pain that still live today. I'm not a singer, so I'm not going to sing any. But the spirituals are part of this culture, part of our heritage. People in pain who sang. You know, several years ago, there was this movie, Django Unchained. You know, it, uh, it was Quentin Tarantino's ultimate sort of revenge fantasy. So Jamie Foxx played a slave who, with the help of a German bounty hunter, becomes a bounty hunter himself. And Django kills quite a number of people in the process. Now, Christoph Waltz, he, he earned an Academy Award for his role, and he afterwards appeared in a Saturday Night Live skit. Now, it's an edgy skit, and I actually wrestled about showing this skit. I, I asked Greg for permission. But then I remembered when he was at our church and we'd had a panel, he dropped an F-bomb there. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, so I'm not worried about it now. So, um, <laughs> but he wasn't the only one. The other speaker did too. I'm like, okay. Um, but anyway, let's take, a, let's take a look. Yeah, whoa, over the top, right? You know, and, and, and while, you know, at first I started laughing and then, then you know, I started thinking about how there's a lot of Christians who, who actually kind of think a little bit along these lines. I mean, they think that Jesus is peace-loving, but to a point. And the thought that he really will get revenge on people, that it is okay then for us to take revenge on people. I mean, Greg is going to get into that this weekend. If you've been reading the book, you'll see. I mean, that's, that's precisely one of the issues he's wrestling with for us. But there's a lot of Christians who feel justified in shedding blood because of the violence in the Old Testament. And they really figure that, you know, kind of in a way, it might not be just like that, like three days later out the grave killing everybody, but eventually he'll come back and kill everybody. And I'm here to say that slaves, yes, slaves, demonstrate to us not weakness, but the way of Jesus. I know we don't find a wholesale denunciation of slavery in the New Testament. I wish we did. Paul doesn't do it. Peter doesn't do it. Even Jesus doesn't do it. They don't denounce slavery as a system. And there may be several reasons for it, but, but the New Testament, as many scholars have demonstrated, lays a foundation for undermining societal evil. And one way that societal evil gets undermined is through people living self-sacrificially, which is to say, faithfully persevering as diaspora people. So now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we don't condemn and work against evil. If you come to my workshop, that's going to be something we'll talk about. What I'm saying is that slaves in Peter's day and also in America didn't live and die in vain. Slaves didn't suffer just to fill the pockets of the powerful. Slaves didn't feel the master's whip just to pick cotton and tobacco. Slaves didn't get raped and tortured simply to fulfill the dreams of white people. Slaves didn't have their families decimated in America to make America great. Now, you can't stop there. You can't stop there. I won't let my forebears' suffering be their only legacy. I'm saying 
that God has taken the misery of my forebears as well as the misery of some of Peter's readers to shame the powerful. He's taken the evil of human beings and turned it around on them. God has made it so that if we want to see Jesus, we don't look to the powerful, we look to the powerless. If we want to see Jesus, we look to the slaves. While I wish there never had been slavery, what I will say is that those who suffered horribly are among our best teachers. I mean, he makes the connection for us in the text right there in 21 to 23. I won't read it all over again. But slaves live out what the Lord himself, what the Lord himself endured. You know, I frequently, when I get a chance to talk about some of these things, I frequently mention my, my great aunt, my great aunt Flossie Johnson. Not long ago, I went back to D.C. Uh, for her funeral. She had been a member of a Baptist church for over 65 years. And the eulogist was a retired judge at that time. He was 68 years old, talking about how his mother, my aunt's, uh, great aunt's best friend, um, um, uh, how my great aunt had wrapped him in his first blanket when he came home from the hospital. And he told us all kinds of stories that she would tell him sitting on the porch of the house, how she grew up in rural South Carolina picking cotton, did domestic work nearly all her life, Josie, that would be my grandmother, one of her older sisters. Loetta, my mother. And then Flossie, the three of them were part of the Great Migration, making their way up from South Carolina. They made it up to DC. You know, it's interesting, when the movie The Help came out, I had read the book and the movie came out, I called my great aunt Flossie and I said, I said, did you see the movie The Help? She said, oh, they, they, meaning all the other family members, they want me to see that. She said, why should I see that, Dennis? She said, don't you know every female in your family did domestic work for white people? She didn't want to see that in the movie. They all cooked and cleaned and took care of other people's children. In 1946, my aunt Flossie met a man on a streetcar in D.C., married Clifton Johnson. They were married for 65 years till he died in 2011. Eventually, my mother and grandmother, they made their way to New York, and that's where our story, story starts. But I can only imagine the mess that these women had to face, much that I will never know or really understand. The verbal abuse they took, the segregation they faced, the humil humiliation of having to clean up other people's mess, the thankless task of cooking other people's food, watching other people's children, and then on top of that, to have to cook, clean, and care for their own uh, children. What a burden these women carried for years upon years. And then my great aunt had this rare gift of joy. She lived through that mess and craziness, always had a place at the table for people. She was a tremendous cook. I only know one of her recipes that I keep making over and over again. I, it's a pound cake and I bring it to the staff meetings. Everybody loves my pound cake, but it's on Flossie's pound cake. She had been there for people in times of need. At the end of the message, the, 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 the eulogist, he mentioned how she really just embodied the golden rule. She would do to others as she would have them do to her. And he then challenged us to go and do likewise. You know, when I tell you this, I think about my Aunt Flossie and so many others. They are examples of people on the margins who show the way of Jesus despite suffering and alienation. They're not only to be celebrated, they are to be emulated. So I tell you this story, and my point's not just to say that people without formal education can inspire us, or that poor people can be noble. It's much more than that. Throughout my lifetime, I've seen white evangelicals invite, okay, African Americans to lead worship or to preach, and for years it was the same handful of people that had the imprimatur of white evangelicals that would be up in front, and it seemed that we black folks were good for entertaining white Christians. They liked our music, they liked our preaching style, they were intrigued by us, and I grew sick of that, I'll be honest with you. What I'm trying to say is that our theologians, our biblical scholars, our apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are people who we may heretofore have ignored. We've been taught that only white males do theology and define ministry. But oppressed people aren't here to entertain the dominant culture. We do, however, have important lessons to teach if, if the rest are willing to listen and learn. And 1 Peter shows us that those who have been oppressed are the very ones who teach us the way of Christ. 
So I'll tell you right now, despite the need of many evangelicals to be close to political power, I'd much rather hear the voice of a slave than to hear the voice of some evangelical leader who gets to hang around the president of the United States. How about that? Well, there's a lot more we could talk about, but may God honor the memory of those who suffered unjustly. And then may we honor their legacy, the legacy of diaspora people who suffered, but in their suffering, show us the way of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you for this time that we had together. I thank you, Lord God, that we could uh, sing, we could celebrate, we could laugh, and then we could reflect. And I thank you, Lord, you've given us that ability and you've given us this opportunity. I pray, Lord God, by your Holy Spirit that you would help us to always be mindful of, of the, 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 the shoulders upon which we stand, to always be mindful of those who have shown us the way of Jesus, to honor them, to emulate them, to listen, to learn, to not be so quick to speak, but always eager to listen and learn. Holy Spirit, have your way in this powerful weekend. Lord, the planners have put a lot of work together, but we, we know it's by your spirit that the real work will get done. Holy Spirit, have your way. Amen, amen. amen.